Hi, and thank you for listening to Dream 10X Radio, where we interview people attempting to live extraordinary lives. Our twofold purpose is to both direct and inspire people bold enough to do the same. Dream 10X. Face your fears. Hey, welcome to episode 48 of Dream 10X. It's your boy, JC. I am Dr. Capel. <clears throat> welcome to my studio. Uh, here we are outside enjoying the warmth. It's awesome to have warm sunshine finally. It's been, been a cold winter. So we're in the backyard and we are here today to talk about the book On Intelligence by <laughs> Jeff Hawkins. Jeff Hawkins. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a, a little thing I read in a newsletter that we get, or Cindy gets, and she lets us read every now and then. It's called The Bottom Line. It's got all kinds of random information in it, um, but it's really valuable. It's got some good stuff in it. And one of the things uh, they say in here, well, what is this about, actually? It's, I just... The whole bottom line? No, no, no. Well, do you know what the whole thing is? It's yeah, not about it's, anything in particular. No, it's not. It's just uh, useful bits of information, anything from finances to yeah. health to reading and strategies, neuroscience. It's really cool. My dad gets it for us for Christmas every year and a subscription, and it's some all kinds of helpful tips to for living. Yeah, and mm-hmm. a little short short reading, so um, you can just, you know, while you're drinking Read it pop. on the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but... Oh, so this this one is uh, five things you can do to keep your brain sharp, and number four that they had, um, and, and I like these five listicles as you can tell, five things to do to improve your life, crazy. But um, read more. It says mm. read more. Research conducted by Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center at Chicago's Rush University Medical Center linked lifelong reading with a reduced risk for future cognitive decline, possibly by facilitating the creation of new neural connections. Mm -hmm. Reading is a wonderful way to engage our brains in creative thought, exploration, planning, and problem solving. So that's a great admonishment for how powerful reading is. But it further states that, um, remember how we talked about different ways we learn, whether it's auditory, Mm -hmm. books on tape, books on uh, audible, Audible or mm -hmm. reading on paper, or reading electronically. This says that you actually get more out of reading paper than you do other than any other inputs. Interesting. It says now one third of Americans read a combination of ebooks and paper books, according to Pew Research Center. But reading on electronic devices just isn't the same. It can cause eye strain, yeah. and a 2022 scientific report study found that it creates an overactive environment in the brain that reduces reading comprehension. That makes so. perfect sense. Too much sensory input. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. And you get the tactile I, experience with this, which is a, a right. changes how you learn. Right. So. Uh, and, and I don't know if that research is correct or not, but uh, based on my own uh, feeling about reading, that's exactly how I feel. Like I get more out of paper reading than I do anything else. Mm-hmm. So the book on intelligence by Jeff Hawkins, uh, written by Sandra Blakesley. I think she probably. You know, uh, he told her what to write and she wrote it or something or something like that. I don't know. But um, the two of those collaborated on this book. (laughs) Somehow, some way. So I just wanted to share my top five takeaways from this book. So who is Jeff Hawkins? Have you heard of a Palm Pilot? Yes, I have. (laughs) It was a great little technology when it was when it came out. It was a lot of fun. And Mm -hmm. I actually professionally, I worked on Palm Pilots for a year or two. That's really cool. And if you recall, we had Dave Renson on our podcast, one of the earlier podcasts. I don't remember the number exactly, but go search for Dave Renson. Um, he started a company. He was a co-founder of a company that I worked for. And our focus was on enterprise hot sinks for Palm Pilots. What does that mean to the non-techie? So Palm Pilots, you remember you had to put them in a cradle and you could sync data with your desktop. Mm-hmm. And calendars and to-dos and, and all that stuff. So everything like Google does automatically now. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we take that stuff for yeah. granted, but back, but back in the day, it was it was revolutionary, yeah. you know, exchanging data with a mobile device in your desktop. Um, but we were trying to take that one step further where you could use it in the enterprise wirelessly to sync data from your mobile device to the enterprise. Way ahead of its time. Way ahead of its time then, pretty, and pretty that, that's one of the reasons that company did so well. Yeah. But um, 
But now we take that stuff for granted. Yeah. Like we didn't even have really wireless ability to to send data from a mobile device yet, and that yeah. was like a burgeoning technology at the time. Wow. And now it's just it's ever it's ubiquitous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, cool. Uh, Jeff Hawkins and um, his coworkers founded Palm, and um, they co-invented the Palm Pilot. And in many of its iterations, and I, it was such a tumultuous company history there. I, I was trying to follow it all, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. They got bought by U.S. Robotics, mm. and then HP, and uh, kind of complicated. So I was trying to figure out what Jeff's net worth is, because I, I, you know, I want to see these big business names. Yeah. How much money? Do they have? <laughs> I feel kind of guilty about that, but I'm interested. How much money are they worth? Uh, can't find much on him. So really? I did find that he dropped off the billionaire list in 2001. So he left. They got frustrated with how Palm was being run, and they left and started Handspring. And uh, I think somewhere he, you know, he he was making a lot of money at the time. But then when he went to Handspring, things kind of fell apart, and he dropped off the billionaire list. I'm mm. sure he's still a multi-millionaire, but I uh, can't verify any of that. So anyway, that's kind of who Jeff Hawkins is. Apparently, he's always been interested in neuroscience. And so that's been his real life's passion. And so since leaving all of that stuff behind uh, the mobile device world, he's got into trying to figure out how the brain works mm -hmm. uh, with the sole pur primary purpose of uh, duplicating how the brain works in computing technology. He wants to build an intelligent, he wants to figure out how to build intelligent machines. Yeah. And so that's kind of the genesis of this book, um, is his desire to learn more about how the brain works and to how to codify intelligence in silicone and software, I guess, is one way to put it. Um, so I, I, it was fascinating to learn that about him because I didn't, I, you know, obviously I'm aware of Palm and, and Handspring, but I didn't know of his interest in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So... And that's kind of we're we're kind of moving in that direction too. Yeah. So really fascinating. Um, so he's got a company now called Numenta, and that's what they they do primarily research. They try to put together intellectual property um, around this whole concept of how to build an intelligent machine. Hmm. He also founded a nonprofit uh, called the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, but he did that back in two thousand two. Oh, he came out with a new book last year I want to read. It's called A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. That sounds fun. So maybe it just throws everything that was written in this book out the window and, and uh, evolves it. But anyway, we're talking about this book today. Um, so a lot of fascinating stuff. I was reading this in uh, a real page turner about halfway through. And then I, I got lost. Yeah. When it started getting deep into the consciousness and creativity and, and all that, I, I got I admittedly got lost. But the first the first half of it, uh, just fascinating. So I don't know any. I haven't studied the brain at all. Then didn't, didn't know anything about it. And so to start hearing about stuff like the triune brain, fascinated me because that the reptilian brain is the core. Yeah, the, that, the, that's the first the, the first evolution of our our brains as species and then on top of that you get the mammalian brain yeah and the mammalian brain was primarily concerned with feelings mm -hmm. emotions and stuff like that and then uh my understanding is the evolution of the cortex started with the um the what is that thing called the hippocampus so the hippocampus became the root of our cortex mm -hmm. that thinking brain a thinking brain and yeah. so what was really fascinating to me is I loved evolution in in college and one of the things that really stuck with me was the phrase onto ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny what does that mean and that's the, <laughs> the recapitulation theory that you know as we grow in the womb mm -hmm. the shapes that we take as an embryo to a young to an adult um, recapitulates all the adult forms in our evolutionary past that that we evolved into our current form. So we go through the fins and the tails and the yeah, we gills have tails and, and gills, yeah, all of that stuff. I want as my tail a, back as a growing embryo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's kind of how our brain mm -hmm. is formed as well. Has has formed over time. So we started off with the reptilian brain, mm -hmm. which is responsible for the fight or flight uh, strong responses in us. And then on top of that, you know, the mammalian. Um, warm-blooded I don't know I don't know the the 
a correlation between being warm-blooded and that type of feelings and uh, stuff like that in our mammalian brain. I don't, I don't know the correlation there, but uh, from that, our cortex evolves. So you get basically these three, three core components of our brain that recapitulate the history of our evolution. That blew me away. Fascinating, yeah. Blew me away. And um, so uh, that's, I, I'm tying that together. Maybe maybe that's incorrect from a bio biology standpoint, but it seemed like a correlation that I could make there, the recapitulation theory with our triune brain. I don't know if that's right or not. Um, sounds good to me. Uh, and it was really interesting to, to uh, you know, think about uh, how our brain is put together because I don't, I don't know all the different I'm just talking at high level understanding of the brain I don't know all the different you know the hippocampus and the cerebellum and I don't know all that stuff mm -hmm. um, okay so that was number two the triune brain number three is, is you know j just what the neocortex is so Jeff points out in, the, in his book that he's focused primarily on the neocortex or the cortex and that the reason being is that the cortex is what makes us who we are. It's the thinking part of our brain. Um, go ahead. No, oh. no, no, no. I was looking for recapitulation in my in my fancy dancy oh, neuro, medical not, neuroscience uh, book. It's not in there. <laughs> no, <sorry>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's probably totally erroneous there, but I just thought it was interesting. There might be a correlation there. But anyway, okay. So the neocortex. What is it? So I thought our brains were like a big solid thing, but um, apparently the neocortex, so I have six playing cards, he says six, six regular cards, he says the neocortex is about the thickness of six cards stacked on one, one another, and that's roughly two millimeters thick, apparently. So that's how thick our cortex is. And it's about if you take it out, if you take the cortex out and you flatten it out, it's about the size of a napkin, a, a large dinner napkin. Mm. So it's that size and it's this thickness. That was that's <laughs> really small. interesting. I yeah, think. and it does all the things. Like and and thing. that's what makes us so smart, apparently. Um, and the brain and, and that that napkin, that dinner napkin. Um, you know, it's bigger than our skull, so it has to be folded and mm -hmm. uh, kind of crammed in there. Mm -hmm. And um, just there's a lot of things that are fascinating about that that aspect of it too. That, you know that um, our brains are evolving so quickly. You know, over the span of time, uh, that that we have to fold, we have to fold that that uh, material in our skull. Our skull is fit. not able to, to grow as fast as that material. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, he points out that women's pelvises have had to widen to over time to accommodate the larger skulls that were evolving. <laughs> but, uh, so, <laughs> who knows if we go out. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about my son Matthew when he was born and he just had this giant head. Like, Did I just really? remember That's how funny. big his head was. It just seemed, <laughs> so we are. <laughs> the poor birth mother. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, and I don't know if he's like in a, a step in evolution where he's, you know, got a bigger He's still skull. got a big head. <laughs> he's pretty big head, yeah. But he's, his body's grown into it, so, you know. <laughs> anyway, evolution in the, in the brain and the neocortex. So, two, mil, two millimeters thick here, and um, they... Each of these layers, there, so there are six layers, actually. So if mm -hmm. you can think of each one of these cards as a layer in our cortex. And we do have six layers in our cortex. And um, I think what those layers do is not really clear. And, and that was what he tries to talk about in the, or tries, he talks about in the second half of the book, but I was, I was kind of confused. Mm -hmm. But apparently uh, data comes in uh, from various sensors or whatever and flows up and down those those six layers and horizontally as mm -hmm. well and that's how we make sense of it S make sense of things um he says there's around 30 30 billion neurons in the whole cortex 30 billion neurons and that they're so tightly packed in here 
and each, you know, if you if you were to look at the cortex side on, there's just so many cells in there that they can't even count them right now. You know, I guess at an electron microscope level, mm. there's, they're just so densely packed in there. Yeah. It's out of also a Scientific American article by Francis Crick, who um, wrote a, an article called The Astonishing Hypothesis, which also says the same thing. Hmm. That uh, And I think, I didn't write the date down for that article, um, but but Crick says the same thing, that our, our mind and who we are is basically embodied in cells. Yeah. In our brain. That's true. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy to think about. Yeah, it is hard to think about. So, I mean, when you get back to consciousness, that is an interesting factor, so. Right. Um, so my number four is, uh, four key takeaway here was about um, the kind of the, using a metaphor of software, the software that runs our brain, mm -hmm. uh, it, according to what was presented in this book, it's it's all the same software. So you got eyeballs with a, with some kind of connectivity running into your cortex. You got ears running into your cortex. You got you got a nose running into your cortex. All these sensors are coming into your cortex, and your cortex is deciphering what that data is and interpreting it. And um, it's highly complicated data. Like when you think of the vision. Um, he talks about how the eyes do a saccade. It's called a saccade, and it's something like they jitter like three times a second or something. Yeah. Like that. So you're not you're not getting a steady stream of visual <laughs> input into no. your eye. No. And it's upside down. <laughs> you're getting all kinds of like jittery visual data that's coming in. But Which is our, why, like, you see something out of the corner of your eye, like your brain interprets it as something. Um, so also uh, with that. Um, all the sensor da sensory data coming in, Jeff points out that there's really only one piece of software though running all of that. Like, so I, I, I guess I intuited without studying any of this that different regions of the brain would have different way of, of handling the data that's coming in, right? Like you got some part of your brain that knows how to handle visual visual data mm -hmm. and some part that knows how to handle audio data coming in that seems to make logical sense that there would be specializations in your brain for that type of thing apparently that's not the case mm. <laughs> it's just a general uh, it's just a general operating machine and it's a pattern recognition machine it, generally speaking and based on what we teach it to understand then that's the neuro neural pathway that evolves that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so there's this guy, Vernon Mountcastle. <gasps> Daredevil! The real Daredevil! What? The comic book character Daredevil? <laughs> what does that have to do with Vernon Mountcastle? That's the guy you're going to talk about who's blind. No! Right? Never mind! <laughs> Just kidding! We're not to Daredevil yet. Vernon Mountcastle was a neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> <laughs> not Daredevil. <laughs> And uh, he wrote a paper in 1978 called the Organi An Organizing Principle for Cerebral Function. And he basically proposed that the cortex uses the same computational tool to accomplish everything it does. Now we're to Daredevil? <laughs> <laughs> no, Daredevil. Um, and so this is fundamentally important, I think, in trying to learn how to build an intelligent machine. Because mm -hmm. that means you don't need separate computing modules for sight and hearing and all that. You should be, I mean, if you were to model, if you successfully model the brain, you've just got one computing platform that, that knows how to do it all. It just, it's, it knows how to interpret the data based on the type of data it is. And then, and, and this was exemplified by recent um, experiments where blind people were able to see by having electrical stimulus on their tongue. Now we're to Daredevil. Thank <laughs> <laughs> <Dang> you. <laughs> um, so talk about that study because that's really cool. Yeah, so uh, uh, I read about it um, in the book, but I couldn't find it again. But uh, a Google search popped up a couple of different things. Um, there was a, um, an example of a climber, mountain climber in Colorado, who lost his sight 
um, through reticular degeneration. And uh, he was able to uh, use a tool, I guess, that you could strap onto his forehead and it had an electrical stimulus on his tongue that um, would take the visual input from what was on his head and apply electrical stimulus to his tongue. And it would allow him to get some general picture uh, in his brain of what he was, what was in front of him. So that means that the sensor, the uh, taste part of the brain, saw could, was getting visual data from this sensor and knew it was visual data and was interpreting it accordingly, even Incredible. though it was incredible. Even though it was uh, born to, you know, always work with taste and yeah, tongue. yeah. So I think that that so remapped right the neural network or remapped uh, the neural pathway. I don't, I don't know about that, yeah. but I, uh, but it does seem to indicate that the cortex, it doesn't care what kind of data it gets, mm -hmm. but it knows what kind of data it gets and knows how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. And that's a that, hell of an evolution. That's awesome. I mean, that is a really, really, really interesting discovery there. So from a, so how would you build that from a computer science perspective? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Okay, so my so that was the fourth point. The, f the fifth point is that um, my cards here. So you, in this cortex, you've got these six layers, right? And um, it's just packed with what they call cortical columns. Mm -hmm. So up and down these cortical columns that's, that go across the, the uh, that's, that go vertically through the stack of cards that process data and they're packed together in there and I, I can't explain what, what exactly they do but from a high level apparently there are these cortical columns in there data flows up and down the cortical columns the general structure and your uh, cortex is what's responsible for our intelligence um, and it kind of reminded me of the OSI mo networking model what's that <laughs> and again I'm making a, a I'm making a correlation that may be totally erroneous but um, in computer networking, there's a there's what's a computer model. networking? Well, how you how you connect computers over a network? Okay. So, this computer is talking to a Wi-Fi router that talks to Verizon, that talks to the internet, whatever. That's, so it's the whole system. Yeah. Okay. Computer, how, how network? How computers talk to one another on the network? And there's a there's a uh, an abstraction, a level of abstraction to kind of describe and explain how that communication happens, so that all the different types of computers, different types and operating systems and all that, they all speak the same language. And okay, sorry about that. Um, our machine computer did not survive the elements and overheated and shut down while we were recording. <laughs> so we decided to come back into our home kitchen studio here, which is where we usually do our podcast from. And now uh, I have coffee, so I'm highly energized. Woohoo! Yeah, so also in her coffee, she you put cayenne pepper in your coffee. That's so, so weird. So it's called like a, a spicy mocha. So you do like regular unsweetened cocoa, uh, like a tablespoon, and then cayenne pepper, how spicy you want it, and a little bit of milk, and it is awesome. I wouldn't want it in the morning, but it's perfect for like an afternoon That's gross. tangling of your taste buds. <laughs> Does it help you see? <laughs> It does, because I am daredevil. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, just wanted to finally wrap up the point that I was trying to make about cortical columns and how it, I thought that it kind of looked like, how the cortical columns work with data flowing up and down and horizontally kind of reminded me of the network OSI model, which has seven layers to it. But interestingly enough, like the bottom, the bottom layer of the seven layer OSI model is uh, physical, it represents physical connectivity. Mm. So if you plug in an RJ45 ethernet cable, that's your physical connection. You could say that your eyeball connecting to your cortex is that physical connection. Oh, and then yeah. the other six layers of the cortex could, could kind of map to the OSI model. That's interesting. That's an interesting connection. So the way I, I remember the OSI model is the uh, saying, um, please do not touch Superman's private area. So, <laughs> so the P is the Aww, physical. Man. We got the data and then the network and you know, you know, <laughs> session, presentation, applicant. What? What's all man? What if I want to touch his private area? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Unless I'm Superman. <laughs> anyway 
that totally didn't go right. But uh, OSI model, I thought could be apropos to uh, kind of explaining the uh, cortical columns and how they how they work. Because there's six layers of the cortical columns. So, you know, there were the six layers of those uh, cards. So each one of those represents a layer in the cortical column in the in the cortex. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm full of crap. I just thought it was, there could be an interesting correlation there in terms of you know, computing and making an intelligent machine and how our brains actually work. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Uh, just something I thought about. Uh, so, that was those Those are the five top takeaways that I had, but there's a lot of other things. Um, he also says the capacity of the human neocortex may turn out to be relatively modest some decades from now. This book was written in 2002 or 2000, 2004. Um, I don't know. I mean... One of the, one of the, did, did we talk about prediction? Uh, uh, no, we didn't. We didn't? Mm -mm. Um, well, shoot, that should have been one of my points. Well. Uh, one of the, he points out that one of the key aspects of the neocortex is its predictive capabilities. Mm -hmm. And when you think in terms of evolution, um, being able to predict how outcomes is essential to survival. Human yeah. survival. Well, and it's why we are on the defensive all the time as humans, like because everything triggers our our amygdala, and like we. So, for example, you have a meeting with your supervisor. Your supervisor says, "We need to talk," or "I need to call you into my office." We immediately go into fight or flight mode because that's survival mode, and predictive and predictivity says that we're going to get in trouble for whatever reason, and uh, so it's like de-stressing. And trying to be emotionally intelligent enough to recognize when that's happening. So yeah, it makes perfect sense. And then like in our ancestors, they had to be able to predict when the um, weather was changing or when the flowers were coming out or when that saber-toothed tiger was going to take you and what that looked like in your environment. So all the sensory input that we're learning constantly that now we've shut down. I mean, it all cycles back to uh, where society's bad. <laughs> yeah, well... Uh, yeah, um, when you think about, oh, there's just so much there to think about. Uh, predictive capabilities of the of the neocortex. Mm -hmm. uh, and think about Stonehenge. Oh, yeah. And the reason Stonehenge exists is so humans could predict the weather patterns yep. and when to farm and when to start farming and when to start planting and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just, it's survival. Yeah, and, it's, and everything was down to me. You think about our, our ancestors, our evolutionary ancestors. We didn't have all this technology and calendars and, you know, internet. and it, We had to actually look up at the sky and see the stars. And, and, and now we can't even and, see the sky. And understand what those mo movements meant and how we could understand those movements to predict the future. Yeah. And how that prediction could impact our survival. Uh, and then finally, he's got one quote that I noted about entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. Um, one of the keys to entrepreneurial success is that you must jump headfirst into a new field before it is 100% clear uh, to you that you'll be successful. Timing is important. Mm. I just thought that was a good quote. Um, so in conclusion, conclusion thoughts, um, Jeff focuses on the neocortex or on the cortex as being the central part of the brain that is necessary to duplicate in order to create an intelligent machine. I have to say that, uh, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't, I just started reading about neuroscience and brains and stuff. I, I'm not sure I totally agree with that just uh, at a fundamental level, just based on um, how our brain has evolved uh, over millions of years and all of the stuff that's happened to us as humans over all of that time, you know, how, learning how to fight the saber-toothed tiger, learning how to hunt buffalo, mm -hmm. uh, surviving the winters and l learning to plant and, and all of that stuff. All of that has gone and has been baked into our brain, starting with the amygdala yep. on up into the, the mammalian brain. And, and, and we're constantly evolving our cortex. Uh, how, how do you disregard all of that history to, be, to create an intelligent machine? I, I just, it, to me, logically, I don't, I'm not sure that I agree with that. Yeah. Like, I would want to... One thing that's absent from here, um, another thing that seems to be absent from, from consideration in this book is, like, laughter and joy. Oh, and yeah. Sadness and empathy and all of those feelings. That I guess those are in the mammalian brain. Those come from the mammalian brain. But how do you teach imagine? a computer to have feelings? But, but how do you disregard that is, is my yeah. point. I don't know how you do, how, I don't know how you teach it, but how do you disregard it yeah. to create a, a human like, um, 
and, uh, computer. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, why would you? Why would you want to? Because empathy can change how you would react. Exactly, in a and, and and those those feelings have also been key to our success as a species. Yeah, like having empathy for people and. Well, and, and also, love, like, humans are made to be social. Humans are made to live in teams. But computers are not. Right. Yeah. Well, well. I guess they are with the networking capabilities, but they can be their own right. individual system and be totally okay. Whereas humans, right. like, you go a little nutso. <laughs> <laughs> not me. I guess I was... <laughs> You're on me all day. How could you not be nutso? <laughs> I'm what? You're on me all day. How could you not be nutso? <laughs> So those are my concluding remarks. Um, I wanted to find out what you're reading. Tell us what you're reading. Oh, gosh. So for when I'm walking the dog or driving the car, I am reading the... <laughs> listening to... Wait, yeah. Let's clarify. <laughs> Let's clarify. That. The um, uh, Adam Grant's Think, Think Again. I'm blanking on the name. It's, Think. it's really, really good. Um, as well as Brandon Sanderson's series. Really good. Awesome. Series of what? Um, oh, what? The Stormlight series. What, is it a story? Uh... It's a fantasy novel. Oh, okay. It's a fantasy series. Okay. It's really good. I definitely recommend it. And then for, uh, I'm working on a couple of neuroscience classes, and we this is one that we just started, and it's The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Fascinating. So this guy had a stroke. And he was, I forget the name of the disease, but you're trapped in your body. So you're totally conscious, but you're trapped in your body. Mm. And typically with this, this situation, you can still move your eyelid. So the, the, a translator came in, realized this was happening, and then he wrote a book one letter at a time with somebody going through the French alphabet. And when he would got to the, that letter writing it down, he wrote this entire book. But how would he communicate the letter? So he would like move his eyelid. And which so, did what? Which did what? He would just move his eyelid. So that I would be like, I'd start saying the alphabet. Oh, okay, I got So you. she would say A, B, oh C, D. When you get to D, you'd blink your eye. Hmm. And so he wrote the whole book like that. Uh, so I like, give incredible patience between the, the, the writer and right. the guy. But it's uh, apparently what all of his what he's going mm. through and being trapped in his body what that's like and mm, mm. Um, from my understanding because i haven't finished it yet i just started it the um, integration between uh, time is wildly different because for him uh five years ago was the same as today because the way his brain is now working um because mm. so because time is one of our sensory inputs right. time and space right, right, and, right. Now, and that's one of the key things i took from this yeah time, time is an important uh yeah yeah what you said. yeah and now his sensory <laughs> inputs are gone so, so the way that his mind works is wildly oh, different. Oh, interesting. So I'm so excited to like get into it more. So yeah, started this hmm. and then also Deb Dang uh, Anchored. It's, um, this is about neuroscience and the polyvagal theory and how our vagus nerve actually completely transforms our brain and how we can interact with it with more intention uh, to either calm hmm. or <laughs> what do we need to do to like get in a good headspace and, and move forward. So I just started this one. How to befriend your nervous system. <laughs> that so, gets back to the point, like, how do you just focus on the cortex when all of that, the all nervous system, your yeah. gut, uh, you know, all of this stuff is central to how we act, who we actually are. How we yeah. Actually, so and that's I why, like, know. the deep I, breathing is what so... What do I know? But... <laughs> that's why with me the mindfulness and meditation, like, why the deep breathing is so powerful, because three deep breaths immediately trigger the vagus nerve, which triggers your rest and restore systems mm. saying, I'm not, mm. I can, I'm not a threat. This is not a threat. I can relax. Mm. So it's, it's really cool. So mm. that's more about that. Uh, play. I just started this one as well. And it's really how to bring more play and joy into <laughs> You're our not work. ADHD at all, are you? <laughs> yeah. I literally like, okay, which one do I want to read now? What am I in the mood for? And I'll read it for a little bit and I'll switch. Sometimes I'll like stick oh with one. <laughs> it's whatever I'm in the mood for, right? <laughs> and then this most epic series. I'm almost done with this. I am in the last quarter. So freaking good. And then there's two more by Paul Zier. Um, so this is Becoming Batman, and he literally goes through neuroscience, physics, health, on how an average person could actually become the Batman. 
so freaking cool. I want to read that one, the Iron Man one. Yeah, and so this one I'm reading next, which is Captain America, which is again the kind of the same thing, and all the science that's out there to really um, change somebody's DNA and transform them into Captain America. <laughs> and it's all like real, like he actually goes through medical science and real life science to. Oh, it's so cool. That's good. And stuff. then the last one is inventing Iron Man, and that's more along this line with the artificial intelligence that you're. And machine, machine, yeah. machine learning. That's awesome. So when we finish that series, we're going to do a podcast on it because it's freaking awesome. <laughs> cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yep. I don't know how you read multiple books at once. I, I don't know how do you it. only read one at a time. I can only do one thing at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I got a slow processor. I have a small neocortex. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> on that note, thanks for watching. Bye.